Ja. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Unscripting Mario. Interview hosting by Email Bonte. Hello. Aww. Hello. Uh, all right. All right, Mario. So today, um, I basically wanted to focus this on uh, not only getting to know you. But one of the best ways of getting to know you is to focus on the environment that built you and the personality that we have to deal with today. So uh, I was going to, I, I'm going to ask you essentially a couple of questions and um, tap deep into your memory to um, find out basically um, how you lived, um, uh, the people and influences around you as you were coming up to get to know how your personality was, how it's changed and stuff like that so we can get to know you a little bit better. So, um, let's start off, um, let's get to know your family because th I'm sure they're the most important part of your environment, especially when you were, the, were a kid. Um, so when you were young, can you um, give me a quick, some quick stories of your family um, environment, your household, what it was like to live back in the day when you were five, or if you remember around six, seven, eight, nine? What yes. was your family environment like? Well, I think it's important to understand my parents. If you're going to understand anything about me, you really have to understand my parents. The reason why I laugh, because they both have sort of complicated stories, very humble beginnings. Okay. My mother was the half Chinese, half black child born to a 15-year-old, and in Daytona Beach, Florida. When the man next door got my grandmother pregnant at 14 and she delivered at 15, my mother back then in the rural South was a little half Chinese child. And uh, so she had very humble beginnings. Okay. Even though she would tell you that she, she never thought of it that way because the, she was surrounded constantly by love. You know, uh, people who loved her, who cared for her. And so she would tell that story. That's a lot to do, but just to understand her humble beginnings. She never went to a library until she was in college. Okay. They didn't let black folks go to the library. Now, my father, who came up in Philadelphia, the son my, my, of two unskilled workers, my grandmother basically did domestic work, and my grandfather, I'm not sure, we don't know what he just tell me what you remember. We tell know me what he did. He did, but he didn't do much work. Just tell me about much your work dad. Than my grandmother. At least that's the way I hear different versions. But okay, so your dad he was, was a very it? unique personality. My grandfather, being that he had some substance problems, he was known to be. But anyway, my father came up underneath that because even with all those issues, he always made a big deal. Of my grandfather being a Hemsley, which my father bought into, even though. He was not a particularly good student. He had to actually repeat the 12th grade. Okay. And he actually tells the story during that summer. When he was off, he worked unloading uh, bags of sugar. And he said when the white man who worked the conveyor belt would get irritated, he would speed up the, <laughs> speed up the conveyor. Okay. <laughs> and all the black people working in that 100 degree heat. <laughs> and that's what he knew he was going back to school. Okay. <laughs> he said right then he decided... So my father went back, finished high school, did better, way better, went to Bethune-Cookman where he excelled, met my mother because they were both on the basketball team. My mother was on the female. My mother actually lettered, I believe, in basketball, track, and tennis. They both went to the same school? At Bethune-Cookman College. Okay, they both went to the same college. At Bethune-Cookman College. And my father, who was the roommate of... Uh, the, the, Legendary coach Cheney <laughs> was then one of the also one of the uh, players on the team. Uh, my father ch had changed his whole world, and besides being an athlete, he essentially went on to pretty much ace everything. Okay. Uh, in his quest to become a physician. Okay. So that is my my 
To understand me, you have to understand that my parents came from that beginning. And even though, and my father, who ultimately became a physician, he got into medical school because he was waiting tables and the, the man take who he was waiting on was so impressed with him. And my father's toast said, he asked my father some questions and my father said he was pre-med, the man was more interested in a black man waiting tables. And then he asked my father, did he have any papers? Or my father went to his room at the hotel because he was working at a resort. Uh -huh. Got the papers and brought it back to the guy who was a trustee. Uh -huh. And the next thing you know, my father was admitted to Jefferson Medical School. Oh, so it, it was circumstance. It was just... Well, it was hard to get in. They weren't letting black people in. No matter what kind of grades you had, it was those days, okay. 1950s. All right. So my father ended up pressing the man who forwarded his application and then spoke highly. They looked at everything, but he had. He had been a, stel a stellar student at Bethune-Cookman and also an athlete. Well, so that got him into uh, medical school. Did he ever impart on how he was able to um, change his habits from being a terrible student to suddenly acing everything with their like a Oh secret? yeah, because that's part of what affected me. That, I, That's the part. In other words, I know <laughs> the whole the whole idea of recreating self. Uh -huh. You know, my father started using terms like introspection with me when I was like nine years old. By the time I was thirteen, he said you would already have been being introspective for three or four years with some conversation about it <laughs> because that's the way it went in my household. I was I don't remember ever being told to shut up. Unfortunately, I was also asked for opinions on everything. <laughs> you had to have an opinion. Okay. And then you had to take responsibility for those opinions. So you could say something stupid, as I often did, and then my father, that would prompt my old man to send me to the bookstore. He also set up a charge account for me at the local black bookstore right in the community because his whole thing was read anything. I don't give you reading Playboy. <laughs> so how f how far along was he um, into becoming a doctor that he, that he decided to have a family? Was he well into being a physician before he started having kids? My parents got married before their senior year at Bethune Cook. Really? Okay. How how old, <laughs> would, how old was this? Would you say? I was born when my was twenty two. So they probably when they were like twenty one. Okay, that's twenty one, right. twenty two. So they got married before their senior year at Bethune Cookman. My mother was supposed to go to the Olympics, but back then you couldn't go if you were married. And she wore, she preferred yeah, to be Olympics married. Olympics what? Uh, Olympics and what? Well, well, she going to the Olympics for what? I believe, and then I have to ask her. I thought it was something in track and field. Okay. Because she was a, she was, remember I told you she was, she lettered in three. I believe it was three, it might have been four, I have to check. But it was tennis, track, and basketball. At Bethune Cookman. And the rule was you couldn't apply you for couldn't, You couldn't be in the Olympics if you were married. And she was actually told me at that time it was a, not a crisis because she just wanted to be married more. And so she decided she wasn't going to the Olympics. Wow. All right. Just to think, um, yeah, gold, Olympic gold was less Amazing. appealing than you. <laughs> than you and your actually, brothers. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, you know, that, and that, those decisions that, that go into those things. Yeah, that, that says something. Yeah. Huh? So the point being, because both my parents are hard working mm -hmm. and stress the whole concept of introspection, improving self, working at that. Uh -huh. That was kind of an overall tone. When I tell the, my mother now, I said, believe it or not, you, you charted a pathway for me. Whether I don't know if young people realize they're doing it. But there was a way made where I was encouraged along a certain pathway in terms of thought because my parents had good advice all the time. I didn't necessarily, like every child, I didn't want to do it all the time. Okay. But I always knew they had good advice. They never had bunco advice. Well, never. Set the scene. anything. Set the scene for me. So your parents were very young. They decided to have a family. Um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> As you guys were all coming along, uh, as you guys were all coming along and stuff like that, it seems like academia was important to them because for your father, he had that. My much father had a family when he entered medical school. Okay. Where he's also working part time while he was in medical school. 
And how how Waiting tables, bartending. Was it, was it just um, was just your older brother at this time, or he had both of us at that time? Okay, so you and then we were both toddlers. Do you remember his plate as he was going no. through it? No, I remember Philadelphia in the snow. Okay, and being a, I remember the house sorta. Tell me what you Parts remember about the house, like the yard. My grandfather having German shepherds. Um, what else can you tell me? I can remember my grandmother. Uh, very, you know, my family's a very loving uh, group, if not challenging sometimes, because they all are intelligent and have opinions. Even from those hum from those humble beginnings, all of them. Mm -hmm. for the most part, did things, accomplished things. And so that's part of, again, what my influence. Very strong women on my father's side, very strong women. And your grandfather, your grandparents lived with your father and your mom? You all lived together? That, when they first got married, especially in that first year my father went to the medical school, I think it was that first year they lived in the house. Okay. And then they rented a, <laughs> then my uncle, Actually, who was the youngest, not the youngest, but he was, well, he was the, of that group. He was the oldest of the group, but he was one of the youngest Hemsleys ever to own property like that. He bought a building okay. and rented a room to my father and my mother when he was something like 23, 24 years old. Okay. <laughs> and he's the only, I always wanted to say he's going to be the first millionaire Hemsley. And he was had a humble beginning. He just was, you know, as far as I know, he was, had no, he was his manager, worked his way up and ran this and ran that and and eventually bought property and managed that. And so, again, that was that, that my family has that work ethic yeah. in there, kind of. Everybody does stuff. So at this young age, you were mainly only um, introduced to your father's side. That was mainly um, the family members you were um, uh got to know essentially did you get to know your mother's side of the family no, well my mother's mother yes ultimately she came out here but she was dying at the time of cancer she oh. actually died out here i met my mother's father uh once too okay uh, once or twice uh, but we moved from Philadelphia when my father finished medical school. That's well, a four year process. Let's not jump he came around to yet. California. All right, let's not jump. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about um, Philadelphia. What can you tell me that you remember about the house that you oh, were. Not too much, other than it was one of those um, row houses. I believe it had three stories, three levels. Wow. Okay. You know, it's common for them to have three levels you staircase, 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 and attic sometimes. So, you know, I think I remember I was up on the third level. I visited once and I stayed on like on the third level. Okay. But, uh, so that's, I, and, and certainly small for for the amount of people that were there. Okay. Uh, how, um, how long do you, do you say you lived in that particular house? Oh, just maybe a year. But I only know from my mother's stories. Okay. Because my memory doesn't include other than vague, pieces because I was there when I was there you're talking about one you know one two oh, okay okay so I have very vague and so most of the memories I have of the house are even probably later okay it may have to be merged from when I visited as a teenager of the house because I visited the house and I was taking it all in again you know but I was like 13 okay so, so I've been bad we went back periodically so the family house I don't even know what happening with that now whether they sold it I think they finally sold that family house okay but my memories actively for the most part are from here in Los Angeles because okay. I was when I came out here yeah tell me about what you remember tell me about what you remember when you find when you came to live here in the LA house what well the first, like? the first thing I remember is that my mother we drove out here mm -hmm. and my mother made a whole Sleep play area of the back seat. That's all I can remember. How much fun it was. She had it all laid out. I guess she had packed stuff down in the lower parts and then put something over that. But the whole thing felt like you were going on this fun, this event with the whole back seat with toys and stuff. Now I must have been four or five, probably okay. four. 
And then so, but so that whole process of coming to California was a big deal. California was the promised land, even though then I was so young, it was just still the adventure of going off and driving here. Okay. And we were driving here because my father had gotten his internship at L.A. County Hospital. Okay. Where he was coming to his internship and later his residency in obstetrics and gynecology. So my father now had graduated medical school. And they list them because they don't have a whole bunch of black graduates in those days from Jefferson Medical. <laughs> Um, He's listed. I, to, I don't know exactly how many they have. So why, why were he unhappy in Philly? Was he unable to get the opportunity in Philly? My father hated Philly. So he, as soon as he found he out something Philly. happened in he L.A., he jumped to get out of Philly. He used to always say, the only reason he goes back there is to visit the family. Okay. He hated Philly. He hated the weather. He hated the political environment. He had no trouble telling you. He hated Philly. He was so anxious to leave there. The wonderful thing about it, my mother always says this, he had a choice, he's either Cook County in Chicago, so the big decision between my parents was L.A. or Chicago. Okay. And my father came, decided on, with my mother on L.A. Now, as it turns out, that ended up being a huge decision because we were the first of the family to come here. So there that led to a migration. The, so nobody was on the West Coast. Nobody. At all. We were the first of the family. Now what happens and you might even ask your own family. Okay. When one goes and everybody here, you know your cousins out there in Los Angeles. What? Yeah, they went out there in Los So my my mother and father coming out here uh -huh. led to a, a slew of people <laughs> who moved, aunts, okay, other family members, and of course everybody visited came to visit LA. So the wonderful thing about it, if you can imagine Los Angeles growing and blossoming as an environment, and here's this next migration that which people don't talk about so much, but there was a huge migration into California, okay. white and black, and other cultures too. And my fam parents represent part of that. And because of them, mm -hmm. we were known as the West Coast Hemsleys and other folks came out here too. Moved out here and lived out here, my aunt, and then everybody visits. Okay. So they know LA. A lot of my family knows LA because of that. So it ended up being wonderful to come here and grow up in Los Angeles. Do you remember what your first impression was like when you saw the house when you were however old you were? When we came out here? Yeah, when you came we out. We stayed here. in a series of motels at first. Okay. While they were looking for a place. Oh, they didn't have the house ready. yet? Yeah, because one of the whole motels is old. It's over on, uh, it's over on, like, near downtown on, like, Washington Boulevard, right near downtown. Do you think you find it now? It's raggedy and stuff, but I sort of remember how it used to look. They had a pool. Uh -huh. I used to like the pool. So I, I, I don't, this, we, I know most of that, the story is because of my mother. Okay. When we finally found a place that we moved into, my, it was because my parents found a place and they rented it over on Gramercy Place. Okay. Gramercy, if you know, it's not that, that far from, uh, you know, it's over there near, yeah. uh, what, from, what, Vermont, Vermont? Gramercy, uh, Gramercy. Near the Vermont. park, yes. right near the park. Yeah. Gramercy right near the park over there. So how long were you uh, journeying through all of these motels before you found your home? Don't know. I don't think it was long because the whole point was my father was moving here to do his residency. Sooner or later, we settled in. Okay. Um, because we didn't, we stayed there living there. When we moved, when we moved, which was over to King Boulevard. Back then, it was called Santa, right down the street from Audubon. Wait, it wasn't That was King the second yet? place we moved. Back then, it was named Santa Barbara Boulevard. Really? Yeah, they didn't name it King Boulevard till that recent. Remember they, well, remember how old we are. <laughs> I was there before King when King was just starting I, to happen. Yeah. I only remember. <laughs> yeah, right, speech. that's cool. My yeah. mother was calling me to the TV to come listen to the speech. Oh shoot! Okay. So that's how young I was. Yeah. So yeah, so all of that was just happening, and LA was changing because of the. Well, it was LA was changing anyway, because everything was changing in the whole United States, and it was happening right at that time. Okay. So all of Los Angeles, was, so my our patterns of movement sort of reflected that, and the fact that my father was gaining 
you know, uh, it's different in those days. Doctors didn't get paid like they do today. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot more years where you had to do, you know, extra work or do other things to make money. So wait, wait, he was doing, he was a doctor doing day job stuff? No, no, you could work as a doctor, but oh, you had okay. the moonlight. In other words, back then when you were a resident, yeah. when you were in training, they didn't pay you, they gave you like a stipend, like 250 a month or something crazy. <laughs> Like that. Now, yeah. nowadays, you make like fifty, forty thousand yeah. dollars Yeah. Back then, it's like the NFL. And the they, so back then, they had a stipend. And you just, because you were training, so you were supposed to be happy to be working your ass off for 24 hours, you know. You're supposed to be thankful for that. That continued that line of thinking all the way through my training. Wow. When they worked me, when they, they, you went home when they said you could go home. You know, like that's the first thing you learn when you were training, when you're a doctor. The first thing you understand, you you would talk to your. I would explain that to the interns. Your day ends when I say it ends, and I'm going home at nine o'clock tonight. Whether or not we started at seven makes no difference. Okay, so if you don't get this work done, you'll be here. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that another time. That's let's, the way they work. That's the way they work when you're training to be a doctor. All right, so let, let's focus. So uh, you, you were bouncing around from um, hotel to hotel. Well, I don't know if I say we were bouncing around. We stayed in a series of places while my parents were who were new. Mm. Back then it was different. L.A. was different. No one knew anybody. There wasn't the same setup, so you had to come and fill, fill it out. And I can't remember... My mother got a job teaching That's what about at that. Fauché. Okay, so did, was she um, was she a teacher even in Philadelphia? Or did she she was a teacher by training at Bethune Cookman. Well, okay, physical education. So her first actual teaching job was in L.A. As that, far as I know, because okay, based on the movements, they would have graduated at Bethune, moved to Philly, okay, to go for my father to go to medical school. And at the end, what she did, and what what she worked do, doing, while my father in medical was in medical school, was a variety of things. I know she worked in department stores too. Okay. Doing retail and other stuff, because again, you have to remember the times and being black, you couldn't do all those things. Okay. That was a big deal about even her getting a job in Fauché. Okay. You know, being black, it wasn't like that in those days. They could just not want you. <laughs> how old was she? How old were you when she um, started teaching? When we came to LA, my mother put me in school when I was four, which ended up being a long story, because she needed to work. I love. And long, she didn't want to pay for daycare. I love long stories. Tell so me a long she, story. My mother had already taught me like a bunch of stuff because she was a teacher, right? Yeah. So, so you, my you, mother you, took me to school, Western Avenue School. Okay. And checked me in when I was four years old. Okay. I told him I was five. What was Western like? It was kindergarten. I just remember sleeping on the mats <laughs> and a pinata every once in a while or something. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it was kindergarten. That's all I remember. That's right. Yard. That's right. Okay. So it was kindergarten. Okay. And uh, missing my mama and crying on the first day of school and my mother, you know, make you know, cause she could, she could go work and still get there to pick me up. Okay. After school. All right. So I, that's what we did, we did, and so that means I started school at four. Now, because I was in school, my mother didn't want me to blab to the school people that I was four. She started teaching me that I was five. So because she didn't want me to tell the school by accident the wrong age. So you. So I see that. So since it worked so well, I was a big kid like you, right? Yeah. That my mother never told me my true age till I was sixteen. So you. I went my whole life thinking I was a year older. When I came to have my driver's license, my mother chuckled and said, you're not old enough. I said, I've had driver's education, oh, no. driver's training. I've had everything. I want my license. She said, you're not old enough. I said, why? I'm 16. She said, no, you're 15. And I said, well, I said what do you mean? You imagine I'm 16. Well, whatever. Imagine how you would think at the time. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, well, I applied to the school because I had to work. And all those times that you were doing so well, I just decided not to tell you. And all my friends were like, you can't be 50, because that meant I was younger than a bunch of them. So that made them look bad, since I was, you know, more accomplished in some things. You know, more like sports or whatever. But I was actually younger than everybody. That made it look 
bad for them. So I found that at six. I found that at fifteen. Mm. Fifteen that I was not sixteen. Wow. And my mother just laughed, and she I was so aggravated. I was so aggravated. Especially if you're I said, it's right not there. Funny. Yeah, it's it's not right funny, there, mom. Then. She said it is funny. So it's not funny. Well, she well, you did well. You did well. You did well. You did well. All y'all did well. So. Yeah, but you have but to wait I said, another I can't year. Drive. Yeah, you can't drive. <laughs> That's the real issue. I got to wait another year to drive. That was the whole thing, and that meant I also I think I started driving before senior year. It meant it was another year in high school, right? Which is like forever when you're that age, right? Yes. You might as well talk about twenty years to tell a high schooler a year. Yeah. You might as well just tell them. So, if your your mom was working, your dad was working a lot. Oh, she had to work. Remember, my father, when he was in training in county, was getting a stipend. <laughs> how, how many hours did he work? Like a wreck. Oh, back then, they used yeah. to have you on every third or every other. Every third or every other? You would st- Okay, when I trained, okay. you would work three days in a row, like seven to six. Wait. And on the fourth day, you would stay, work the whole night, and in the morning, work the whole day. And uh-huh. you would do that every four days. Now, my Father's Day, they did it every third and sometimes every other. How do you... That means you know you... That means every third, that means every three days, you stay and at the end of the day, work all night to the next day. Work that day too and then go home. I did it every four nights. How? For like nine months out of the year. What? Nine months out of the year, every four nights. So like, how- I work like a beast, man. They work you like a beast. <laughs> and I did, and I was priding myself that I could take it to shit. Like, fuck, bring it on. Bring it on. If, I, if them motherfuckers can take it, I can take it. Bring it on. Let's see who can last. Okay. Now, if you know me, Mel, I stayed up one time. It was like three days, right, just to see what it felt like. But just to, I wouldn't know where the wall was. Where the wall, all I know is because you get weird yeah. after the 48 hours. You get weird, so it got my memory of everything is kind of weird because you're like stone from lack of sleep. Yes, but I think I hit seventy two. I know I've I know I've been up forty eight hours a bunch of times. Wow, bunch of times more than I can count. All right, let's uh, let's let, let's get back. That's so crazy shit. So, all right, so you guys finally you guys finally move into your home. Um, did you see? Which home? Rented home when I, my father was in training. Uh, yeah, let's talk about what, what was. It, what was? Did you did you see your parents a lot during this? Like, what was that? What was the family? Who was taking <laughs> care of you? If everybody was your parent, mother was teaching, your dad was um at the hospital. All my youth, my father was tired, uh-huh. working or working. Did you have a relationship, really? Did, were you yeah. able to build something? Oh yeah, was? and it got yeah because of the nature of my old man. You know, and because oh, because when you're older, he made you go work with him. <laughs> what do you mean? Like you know, a divorced father day. You know, I don't know if you have that. Y'all have that. See, my day if you his father's more active. So you had divorced father day. So the divorced father day. That's when your father picks you up to take you to do all the shit you don't want to do no goddamn way. It ain't like he picking you up, take you to do some fun shit. I mean, it might be some fun shit some of the time. I'm not saying my dad never was never fun shit, but when he called you for Divorce Father Day, you weren't thinking it was mostly fun. He was wondering what was up. Because if he had some fun, like he took you to a movie, he would come back and say, hey, oh, it's only three o'clock, y'all can get some yard work done. Yeah, turn up some of that side. Yeah, get out there. Yeah, ooh, yeah. <laughs> Let some of those, my father would go to the garden, the gardeners, and come home, like to the gardening place, mm-hmm. with a trunk popped open with bags of shit, plants. <laughs> come back, <laughs> plant this shit, and then critique every aspect of it, every aspect. Of it. Walk it, you know, son. Attention to detail. See if you do this fucked up, then one day you do that fucked up, and one day you're just fucked up. So it's my job to make sure you don't fuck up. Did he help? <laughs> no, hell no. My father, I remember my father saw me cleaning the toilet. He said, son, you way too, you way, you too far back. To- cleaning the toilet is an intimate experience, son. It's an intimate experience. <laughs> you gotta get down and reach all around the back. 
We down around the back. Watch that back side of the toilet. Get down there around them screws. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Clean it good like it's a plate. Clean that toilet, get down there and feel it. Feel it, son. Feel the closeness of the toilet. And wash that motherfucker clean. You understand me? <laughs> okay. Because he's going to come back and look at it in a minute. This is... Okay. <laughs> well, I'm getting Because he's going to come back and look at it. This he wasn't going to just let it be like that. This explains he so was just saying, He told me. I don't even like the way you approach the toilet. You, All right, you're, that, not, you're, not, you're not intimate. You're not intimate enough. So, how... how okay, the, the question has to be made. How does... This does not seem like the you habits of why some, I'm ass on now. But this doesn't seem like the habits of two uh, of, of a guy who had two hardworking like this seemed to have had to come from somewhere. Did this come from his grandmother? Was well, they were both hardworking. I guess the parents, even though my grandfather, you know, he so, was he, he was an alcoholic, but he was he, he wanted to clean house. He, he had this wonderful thing about the Hemsleys. You're Hemsley. You, People say, what the hell's a Hemsley shit? You know, y'all Hemsley, y'all Hemsley, you this and that. So well, my he, father used to always say, your grandfather, he would never stop <laughs> talking about how wonderful. So your grandfather instilled a... That and my father, and my father had that work ethic. And because we were, you know, I, as, he got, as we got older, mm -hmm. and he was able to afford, he was a physician, he wasn't going to let me be considered his background. So how he wasn't gonna let me be all bourgeois. That was just not happening. That was like you out of your damn mind. Are you kidding? But he wanted the high. But that's the Are thing. You? He wanted the high standard, but he wanted you to understand the place of everything. Yeah, my father. My father had me re reading the wine list when I was thirteen. Why? Didn't know what a wine list was, and that it existed. And then he would show me why he picked the wine he did. He didn't care. Every now and then, I would taste a little something. He would tell me something about it. He wanted you to know something about everything. I, that is, something that is about understandable. Grow. But as you grow, you learn about everything. So what was so what was it like? <laughs> that was my old man. Dinner was a challenge. Okay, so all right. <laughs> let's, let, let's talk about. Why you want shrimp? What kind of shrimp? What do you know about shrimp? It seemed like tell me what you know about shrimp. Seems like everything was an interrogation. <laughs> no, but you know. When he would take me to the movies, he would always want to talk about the movies. And, you know, he took, I saw Colonel Knowledge. I was 13. Go look at that what? movie. That was too much for a 13. My father wanted to know, now, son, what, is the, what was the whole point of that movie? And I used to go, Dad, can we ever just go to the movie? Why do we have to dissect every movie? You don't want to talk about the movie? I'm just saying, every time we go, Dad, we come, we leave the movie, then we got to debate the movie and dissect all the characters out and... Can we just go to, you just want to just have a fun time and not, you want to indulge your old man who took you to the movie. <laughs> oh, God. And he would bug you like, you know, now that's when he would go to the maternal part of his side and make you feel guilty for not sharing. My father cussed me out in Brooks Brothers. Why? Because I didn't want clothes. Okay, so my father liked clothes, right? Okay. So he wanted to take you shopping and have you trying outfits? He would sit back. You try it out. What kid likes that? No, no. No kid. So I didn't want my father. I was at Brooks Brothers. Y'all know how exclusive that shit is. Yes. My father said, "Am I boring you? Are you bored, motherfucker? I got you down here in Brooks Brothers buying you clothes. Am I wasting your time? Okay. How old, how old were you? I at was this like time? twelve or something. Oh my god. I was like, no, he said, because he was like, because I learned. When I was out shopping for clothes with my father, act interested. Act interested. <laughs> hey, don't act like you don't want no right. clothes. Don't act like you don't want, you know, I wanted some bell bottoms. You know, I wanted some funny shit. Couldn't go shop for that. Unless they had it in Beverly Hills. But that's cool, but you can imagine. If I wanted some hip clothes and they didn't have it on Rodeo, my father wasn't taking me shopping to the surprise store. All right, so. He didn't relate to that. All right. Uh, so, all right, Mario, focus. <laughs> Mario, <laughs> Mario, Mario how fucked up that shit was. Ma Mario, listen to me. <laughs> Mario, Thera kind of therapeutic, uh, isn't it? And, and so, yeah, he said, "Yeah, now that you're standing you there, cussed out at Brooks you're watching. Brothers. <laughs> you're watching. You're watching. Who else gets <laughs> cussed out at Brooks Brothers? <laughs> so, so we all get cursed out for some reason. So, uh, that so, still chills them. <laughs> Did you what, 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 did you guys really struggle when you were younger, like when you were six or seven? No, with money I didn't see issue? no struggle. They struggled. I had I was the son of a doctor. By the time it counted, yeah. 
See, when they, when they, my parents were in their struggle years, I was too young. Okay, so you see, got the, it all felt good to me. So you yeah. got to see. Yeah. So by tell the time me, I, by the time we moved up here, uh huh, to this house with a pool when I was eight years old. Tell me about that. What was that like? We were living before a king, and it was nice over there. I had a big avocado tree. I hated avocados though. And then we came to look at this house with the pool mm -hmm. and the, uh, this outside house. And nobody cared about this outside house. Nobody cared. Nobody else. It became my playground. This was the garage here. But I'd hold upstairs, all of that, that was my playground. I had the size of Mario's office. <laughs> no one gave a shit. Like, yes, I had this. I had campers. I had a whole office. Everything upstairs was all mine. And my mother would come walk. You have it so well that you're so organized, son. Because you whip my ass. <laughs> no, but you have it so well organized, son. Everything is so neat. It's so neat. So I had my lab in there, my chemistry sets. Mm -hmm. I had all this shit. So I moved in here and I was like, come on. I didn't realize how fortunate I was to be growing up on this street where the only other black family was the Dolphins from Dolphins of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Second black family moved up here. My mother looked at five houses on this street. None of the white folks would talk to you. They're all leaving and they're all left, basically. But I didn't that it wasn't a problem to me. I was like living up here with the pool and stuff. I wasn't, you know, racism was part of everything back then, but you didn't internalize it because you were surrounded by a support system that was different. Plus, so I was in, you know. So what was it like? Um, what can you tell what can you tell me because there's this place has been through so many changes. Tell me about the environment. What was the neighborhood like? What was the house like? What what was it like living as a child here? Can you um, well initially the white flight period didn't seem to last very long because it looked it seemed like they kind of went fast. But you didn't like understand it was in a that five year period. Right? That was not beyond your understanding when you were a kid. So yeah, I didn't really care because you're more noticing that there's new people coming to the block regularly, and they were mostly black. Oh, okay. So, so you had a regular thing of new people coming that you were liking. My friends moved on the block. Okay. The, the later on, I was that was the second member. I was the second black family. Okay. On the block, and then was followed by scores. So I did. That's where the peer grew. I, you know, we had enough of the after a while that we could be enemies. <laughs> you know, and up the hill was you know the other black elite, the, the uh, Tina Turner, Ray Charles. You know, Kurt Flood. They all lived up the hill. And you had no did you have any idea? No, I had no idea. First of all, you don't you growing up with this kind of affluence, which is a degree of affluence, there's there's other degrees. But having the kind of parents that I did, you just didn't internalize it the same. For example, the pool. My father refused to have a pool man. He also made us do the yard, and he made us use the old kind of lawnmower that was the push one. No gas, no electric. You know, he wanted you to push it, put the thing on behind it, and get all the... And that pool, he had me cleaning the pool. Okay. People would come over and say, hey, can we swim? My father would just nod at me. I'd be like, go clean the pool before they swim, clean the pool after they swim. I hated people coming by to swim. My father was, oh, yeah, Gregarious. Yeah, come on, y'all swim, Rob. Rob <laughs> What, what about the rest of the house? Did he assign chores and stuff for that, or did you guys have cleaning people or anything like that, or did he want to? No, steal? my mother eventually got a housekeeper babysitter, sort of. Okay. When my younger brother was there, she had to have someone to care for him during the days. But she, but no, we didn't grow up with any kind of, and even the housekeeper, she there was stuff. So who who instilled the Oh tidiness? my mother. Oh okay. Tell me my about mother, that. My mother didn't play. Tell me about Back it. Back then, you know, black people did spring cleaning. Spring too. cleaning. That's when they would just like have you washing windows and shit. They would just get in a cleaning mode. My mother would be in a clean let me tell you, if you killed a roach, you would get toilet paper, pick it up and flush it down the toilet. Because if my mother saw the roach, dead or alive, mm -hmm. that was your ass. She would have me, she had me inside them cabinets in the kitchen, half my body, scrubbing down the walls oh, wow. on the inside of the cabinet, oh, repapering everything. At like four or five? No, that was, by the time she had me doing stuff like that, I was maybe nine or ten. Okay, so. Because from then on, I had work chores. Okay. It used to be like, I know like on Saturday mornings, 
try to get up early, watch some cartoons. But then my mother had shit for me to do. And she would always, I, see, I, I, the conversation I remember is her going, first of all, Saturday morning, her at the bottom of the stairs screaming, get your asses up. I'll be damned if I'm going to work this hard and clean house behind you lazy ass children. That's because on Saturday morning, she would get up, go downstairs where I had been up on Friday night because I was too young to go anywhere. You would sit up all night eating food, watching pop, watching TV till it went off. So the house was jacked up. She got up. So she would go crazy. If there was dishes in the sink, anything, she would go crazy. And then after you got going and cleaned up to all the house, then she was like, if you don't get out of here and it gets to be 1130, I'm going to find some more shit for you to do. So you would get that shit done and go run it out the door. So my mother didn't play. She was ready to. So, so I learned long? not to make a mess because she was going to hold me accountable. She would walk in there. She said, I'd be damned. So as you, this shit. as you started growing up, you did, <laughs> uh, you slowly became to get neater and neater. And well, I was already neater. fairly neat from what she would tell you. I was fairly neat because I had my room organized. Then what was the But she didn't to... allow no mess. All right, but what was I the mean, need like to... you just weren't allowed to have a sloppy bathroom. Like some of y'all have a sloppy bathroom. Mm -hmm. Towels everywhere, peeing on the wall, all that. See, none of that was allowed in my house. That house. My mother said, you can't piss straight to you. You sit down. You better figure it out. You better figure it out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some of y'all cringing right now. You know what you do to the bathroom. I didn't do, I couldn't yes, do none of that. I couldn't we, do none of that. Because we have penises, Mario. Well, my yes. mother would go, you know, you know, back then. I remember my mother walked in one day and said to me and my friend, All of y'all stink. You smell like a bunch of puppies. You should start wearing deodorant. And nobody in the room was wearing deodorant. Nobody, we hadn't even started doing shit like that. I don't remember what age y'all started, but, you know, one day my mother said, you started smelling different. One day you just started sweating different, and all of a sudden you had to start wearing deodorant. <laughs> and my mother had no problem telling you, and when you wash, make sure you lift up them nuts. <laughs> wash, <laughs> wash underneath there and between those cheeks. Make sure you get all in there, between those cheeks, and lift those nuts. <laughs> he said, Mom, please, I, don't, I know my children. Get in there. Wow. <laughs> How many of you were told by your mother to lift those nuts? N not, never, not a once. <laughs> Spread ne we never. those cheeks. <laughs> but my mother, with all her fault, never was drill sergeanting. My mother even asked to smell your hands. It's just sometimes you'll come out the bathroom. She said, Let me smell your hands. Did you wash your hands? All right, that's creepy. You didn't wash your hands, did you? <laughs> Get your ass, nasty. I again. This makes so much. This makes so I didn't get much to have sense. nasty. I didn't get to have sloppy, okay. sloppy clothes. My father was the same way. You know, to you take care of your things, son, because that's that half-ass talk again. Remember, it's one day you take half-ass care of your clothes. You come in, you throw them on the floor, on the bed. That's the way you live. Then your whole life becomes like that. You walk in, everything's a mess. It's all sloppy. That's just. I'll be just be goddamned. I'll just be goddamned. That my lifetime, you just won't get to be like that. Okay. What was his fear of that? Where did that come from? You just not, you just not gonna be fucked up. <laughs> Period. Yeah. You know, my father was the type. This is the way I quote him. Okay. If they had to told you. You know, Rob. Rob. He he has a learning problem. It's gonna take him twice as long for for him to do it do well in it. My father was said we well, can work three times as hard and excel then, right? Okay. No excuses. Okay. So what you're not gifted at that. So work harder. Okay. <laughs> My father said, you know, I fumbled in college. The coach had me carry the football around everywhere I go. He told me if I see you on campus and there's not a football in your hand. Yes, your ass. <laughs> he said, he said, I was carrying football to class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the way people did back then. <laughs> they didn't accept mediocrity. <laughs> so, you know, that's what the way I was raised too. So, you know, to this day, there's no laying, there's no shit laying around, right? Okay. Nothing, right? <laughs> so there... <laughs> So when you were younger, what was, what did you guys do as a family? Do you remember uh, oh, anything? Yeah. anything um, because my mother was such so organized about family stuff. Okay, 
So when my father would go to the park and play basketball, he used to play at West at, at uh, uh, West West that park right over there. On, was that Western Avenue? Park? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Um, the park is that right over there? It's right where the bus station it is. is. Yeah. Well, he used to go over there, and my father would play in the gym, and it was pretty intense basketball, from what I remember. But I was also bored because again, he takes you, and he's going to go play basketball. So I was outside on the rings and shit, doing all the stuff at the. At the, at the, yeah, but my mother would make these wonderful picnics, and my mother' attention to detail and shit like this is partly, you know, she would always have oh wait like uh, punch, yeah. deviled eggs, Hold bunch on. of little stuff. Oh, all sorry, beautiful. sorry to interrupt. You, you have to tell your mother, your mother's need to, uh, to to, to uh, her 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 um, plates and her habits of um, doing a little bit better, like. The lady who raised my mother, Mother yes, Dear, thank you. was a cousin, I believe, a cousin, a distant cousin. But she ended up because she had two boys. She and my mother, and my mother, her mother. At that time, she went to New York to get a job. Mm -hmm. She couldn't make any money in Daytona Beach. So the, this, uh, this lady was a friend of the family. Raised my mother. Mm -hmm. Now, that lady, who basically worked in different, she had different jobs. She also worked as a domestic, but she could make everything. She used to take apart, you know, cloth and furniture, take stuff like that and make suits out of it. Yeah. She would take bags and make stuff. So my mother says she grew up always with napkins on the table because Mother Dear insisted. They always had handmade tablecloths and handmade napkins, and Mother Dear made her dresses and her bows and all that. It was made by hand, and she made the suits. So my mother, again, this is a little small town where she was out crabbing and being the tomboy. When it came time to do what she had to do, she would be totally styling. Demure and she grew, and yeah, she grew. Yeah. She was writing as a, as a young person, junior high. She was writing for the local paper. She had a little column. I read a couple of the stuff. You know, stuff those papers would be about back then okay. but she was doing that kind of stuff so she was always very much the lady at the same time being a tomboy she had a rifle when she was 12 years old <laughs> my mother said I was she said back then everybody was killing stuff to eat the average person they killed something to eat <laughs> the average person my mother said I killed a few things that we ate plus she was crabbing all the time and all that she running around and they told beach and doing that this uh Lisa Myrna so this, so this habit was instilled to her. And yeah, she so had this she, strange duality of... Right, always a lady, but she could be tough, fight, pull out a pistol if she needs <laughs> And the fact, and she knew plating, she knew all like, that. silverware, all that stuff. Because she, but she was tough. Okay, side story. Okay. <laughs> Let's so I got, I had nightmare problems. So I was reading a bunch of books. I read the Boston Strangler. Now I'm waking up at night with Boston Strangler nightmares. Yo! So I'm scared of the bosses. My mother comes in there in the room. My mother goes, first of all, <laughs> he's in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and you in Los Angeles. Then she went back into the bedroom and got a 38. And she said, and if he comes in here, I'll take care of his ass, okay? I slept so good. I slept so good. <laughs> My mother said, I'll take care of him. <laughs> if he comes in here. So you have to understand my mother. She you know she was insisted on stuff, but you know when it was time, mm -hmm. it was time she could always she would always understand. Just like when I came home, I got suspended from schools, and I said these right folks was racist, mom, and they're baiting me at every chance. Okay. And at first she made me explain because she could you know because she was like checking me if I'm lying. But once she listened to me, mm -hmm. I never she understood from then on. Everything that was going on and everything they were trying to do, everything, because she knew I wasn't lying, and I was playing with it. Because I was in LA's first busing program, first, the first busing. You know, walk pack to the pickets. We will, we will. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's 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 stay yeah. on time. Let's so, go back to the picnics with your okay. mom. Was so the picnics were good. When we went to Disneyland back then, mm -hmm. people didn't eat that Disneyland food. They didn't have no food. My mother, you go back to the car. Uh -huh. My mother had a full spread. They would open up the trunk and lay out stuff, a little table and have all kinds of, people would be eating at the back of the car in the parking lot, whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So you would take it and then, or else, the other thing is when we would go on trips, 
Like, so you know, you have those school trips, they send you places, like, oh, you know, yeah. to the zoo. Yeah. My mom would make, okay, she had these special lunch bags that would, you know, where she could fit the right stuff. So my lunch bag would have, like, two sandwiches, you know, fruit, something liquid. It was just everything. I had wonderful lunches. I always had wonderful lunches. She would take the orange. She knew I loved it. So she would take the orange and with the knife, she had a way she could cut the yeah, cut unravel this. it, yeah. And without breaking it, all the way to the end. Oh, wow. And then let it wrap back around. So when I got there at school, I could take my oranges and I would have it all like a decoration. She did that for me all. So my mother did all the little things that made me special. We didn't do birthday gifts a lot. But on your birthday, you would wake up. Like, I would. I, my memories are waking up to the smell of my favorite breakfast. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, be it made. My favorite dinner. She would always have a cake, but we didn't have like gifts. We didn't do things again. I was that's part of my whole thing. I was a raised to demand Christmas gifts or birthday gifts. But on your birthday, you were special, though you were held as special. You were treated as special and celebrated. And it was that. It was certainly communicated to you that it was your day. Okay. And and, and my mother would make your for me all my favorite foods. All of my favorite foods. Kidney stew, rutabagas. <laughs> So did, did did you guys do um where did you do things with your mother and father together or was it mainly uh, We did some but my father remember by the time my father was in control of his life, my parents were really divorcing. Really? You know. So my parents divorced and I was like Was it a money issue 13? or Oh no, my no. My father was fighting, but my father cheated. We talked about all that. My, my father was, you know, we, we, one thing about my old man always challenged me to be, be better and talk to me very poignantly about issues where he thought that he was flawed. He challenged me to be better. He says, I cheated on my women. I'm challenging you to be better. He says, that was, he says, there comes a point where you have to make choices sometimes between what you want mm -hmm. and what the people who love you want. And he says, unfortunately for me, too many times I make the wrong decision because I'm too selfish. But, it, but it's, remember, introspection. This is a man talking to his son. So he wanted me to examine self. So the issues of fidelity came up. At what, what, what age? Oh, 12, 13. Were you Mainly he was talking about why he wasn't doing shit. Were you able to understand it at that time? Yeah, what, okay, goodbye. When I, was, I remember I was like 16 or 17. My father told me, Drop this bag off at this hotel. And I drove to the hotel and the girl opened the door and it was some fine. And I'm thinking, who the hell is this? I'm dropping off this bag. I'll tell you I said thanks. And and he got a woman. <laughs> I was like looking at her, I was seventeen, but I knew. From the way she said my daddy's name, that was no casual acquaintance. <laughs> my father had women. Okay. And so he challenged me about that issue. We talked about it. And he did not celebrate those things. We talked about the complexities of doing right when you know right, but the stuff that seduces you. My old man regularly talked to me about the things that seduce you at different ages. We talked about that before we went. I went to college. We talked about that in high school. We talked about drugs and sex and what it's like to be caught up behind a woman. So both sides of the, um, both parents were um, encouraging you to be open with them. Um, you well, were my mother was my was mother was very different. My mother okay. never discussed sex. Oh, okay. My mother, this this is my mother's sex talk. And the boy don't bring no babies home. Well, we I'm t I don't I'm not raised. Don't you bring no good talk? Don't you bring no babies home? I'm telling you. And then this is the other second sex talk, going out on my date. Driving, early days, and be a gentleman. She would hand me a butterscotch. She always was handing me like bits and shit. Uh -huh. You know, I don't know, but when you're going out, have a butterscotch, have a peppermint. Always when you go out, so your breath is fresh. And you know, you know, this is my tough heart. But she was like, and by the way, be a gentleman. Don't be pawing all over the young ladies. I'm like, mom, you don't know what you do not know. I know my children. I know my children. Don't you be a gentleman. And let me watch you. your hands. And you still pawed, didn't you? I damn sure couldn't wait. <laughs> she was so right. 
Couldn't wait to touch a titty. <laughs> Just touching a titty. Even even remember when touching a titty even through the clothes it was like heaven. Just to do a sweater. Just to put your hand upon a breast. You would tremble. Tremble with excitement. That that memory would last you. That memory would last you for months. <laughs> I touched the titty. I, I touched it. I don't think I ever washed my hand again. Can ever. I have memories of touching a titty. <laughs> wow. Remember those, those are some good old days. So, what was your relationship with your mother when you, when you were young? Let's make this, let's make the transition awkward. What was, what was, uh, what was your relationship with your mom? What, especially, what it weird I can highlight the difference of a story of that. Was it weird that she was an educator? Like, did she expect you to Yes, and I okay. didn't do I fell miserably. That's the second Because <laughs> I kept getting suspended. I was suspended like seven times. All right, so what? And my mother's like, how can I keep going to school for my child getting suspended? And I'm a teacher. So what? what so was it, was it a tough relationship because of My that? mother had this thing about sex. She wanted me to be whatever. So okay. I used to get the Playboys over my father's, right? I would go to my father's house, uh-huh. and I'd get all the Playboys. When they were old, you know, he would st- they would stack up, and he didn't want them. So the late, the, I'd leave the latest one or two. I'd take all the Playboys home. That meant all my buddies and me, we all had play- Playboys. So I, I took out the centerfolds, right? Mm-hmm. And I took the because I'm creative. I took the centerfolds, and I put white paper behind it. But first, I traced around the titties, and, and, then, and then I said, and you would bend up the titty and they would say, kiss me or lick me. You know, like you would bend the titties up and the white paper, I would have kiss me, lick me. So my mother, <laughs> my mother found that shit. Oh, dear. My mother, I watched it. She was like, I've, I'm so disgusted. I've never seen, <laughs> I've never seen anything so disgusting. <laughs> you and those pictures you have, your collection, your collection. <laughs> Yeah, I called your father. That's what I'm like. I called your father, told him he's got to come and talk to you about your disgusting pictures. So my father comes against me, and I get in the car. And my father says, "You got to find a better place to hide your pictures." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Mothers don't understand. We all d- draw pictures. Mothers don't understand this shit, son. They yeah. they don't want to." You know, I know you drawing pictures. Are you jacking off? I said, oh. So then he started getting me to talk about jacking off. So I had to get punished Don't by having a jacking off conversation with your father. Now, there's a bunch of men who've had that. Oh my and that's an embarrassing when they ask you. I know you jacking off. Because <laughs> they usually don't ask you. They usually declare you if you have a black father. I know you jacking off. <laughs> Taking them playboys home. Getting the pages all stuck. I don't right. mind. I, I, hmm. So, so hmm. what, I'm just saying. So, we'll, we'll move so that was a different thing. My mother and father. My mother so, was telling me. So your father, your you were your dad was far more open and under. You could pretty much talk to him about just. Oh about yeah. Everything. But your mom was specifically into um, wanting was focusing on um, the things that she wanted you to excel at. She wanted you to be clean. She wanted you to be. My mom was doing with and, me getting with all my bullshit. Like when the teacher called her up and told her I was the class clown. That was the worst whipping I ever had. The lady told me she was going to call my mother. It was the sixth grade. Okay. Okay. Because I was still small enough to whip. And one day that was over. I was too big. But in the sixth grade, the teacher told she, I'm calling your mother. And I could hear him when the phone rang. I chilled. I said, Oh, you could feel yourself stressing. And I could hear my mother. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Oh, really? Uh huh. Mm hmm. My mother got off the phone and went crazy. <laughs> Lost her mind. I remember her beating my ass. Every day you got something to say. Every day. You're the one talking, joking. Every day. Oh, I know you won't. I know you won't. Never again. Ever again. Because you're not going to keep embarrassing me every day. Up in school. <laughs> I don't even remember how many. But she whipped my ass. Lord. <laughs> they whip your ass and have the teacher stay on the phone. <laughs> Listen to this. All right, where Jake at? Beat your game. with the teacher. Uh huh, get him. I told him, uh huh. That was those days. They would hit you in school. They would hit you in school. They had SWATs in gym. It was a different time. My mother kicked my ass. 
Because I was the class clown. <laughs> Lord. Okay. But so. Uh, so, so where did that, uh, so where did the need to be, all right. So. She gave me, she has a, I have a book with a bunch of my suspension notices. Because, you know, she saved all that. And she put it all in the book. I have a book in there. I have to show you my mother. See, that's my mother. My mother, as crafts, uh-huh. made all her children and my father. A scrapbook with photos. She has all my suspension notices in there. You know, what I did wrong, <laughs> all that. My class ranking, you know, numbers uh, 615 out of 950. Uh-huh. On the bottom third of my high school class. So she has all that in there. Did you just to show me. Did you feel, do you feel like it was a re, you were rebelling against because of the fact that she was an educator or what? what no, what, what, but I was just rebelling because I was just wanted to do what I wanted to do. I didn't like people. I remember my mother will remember. I had a conversation with my mother around 13. I wanted to know, can I have a limit to the people who get to tell me what to do? At 13. Because I said, I'm really tired of this. I have all these, I like these relatives, like mm-hmm. aunts and uncles. Why do they get to tell me what to do? Okay. I don't want anybody else telling me what to do. I go to school mm-hmm. all day long. They tell me what to do. I come home and you tell me what to do with your mom. So that's wonderful. Of course, I want to do whatever mom says. But everybody else, I don't want to be told. I mean, my mother just looking at me like, where did I get this child? She'll tell you, he never wanted to hear, she used to say I was, she was paying me and I would get mad at her. And I don't remember that. I just remember getting my ass kicked. <laughs> but she would say, you can't change your mind by spanking you. You were that child. You can't, you can't change him. You can't change him. He's going to get, he doesn't get mad. But I don't remember it that way. Okay. I don't remember. I remember her winning all the time. Every time. Okay. <laughs> but, but if we're looking at habits and stuff like that, what then... But well, we were very what, 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 close too. Remember, I loved going to the store with my mother. I would, I would like load the groceries like it was my job. Okay. She would just sit there and smile. I mean, carry on, I mean, because I was big and strong. Mm-hmm. I used to love going grocery shopping with my mother because sometimes I could pick out stuff for her to buy. Mm-hmm. She was amazed by my interest in food. I used to tell her, when I get older, I'm gonna buy a bunch of these. I'm gonna have strawberries. I'm gonna get. She, she'll tell you I used to go to the store telling you when I get older I'm going to have this at the house mm-hmm. I'm have, just like I am now I used to love going to the grocery store I used to like walking around in the food Okay. some of us like it you just walk around and end up with food what's there not to like <laughs> it's, a, it's a grocery store so <laughs> what did you talk to your what was the tell me about conversations with your mom like what do you remember Especially to have the impact with you now. Do you remember any specific talks? Yeah, we talked that- about everything and all the little. That's why my mother, more than my father, dealt with it. Give me, give you an example. Okay. I give you an example. And some of them you don't say a lot, but it's how she said it. Okay. So my mother used to bring home students all the time from Fauché. Okay. Okay. And sometimes they would play with my shit. You know, I already told you. You know, it's my shit. You're playing with my shit. <laughs> so I had this bike, and my mother brought home this girl, kind of big girl. She wasn't attractive to me, so that made me more act because I was a little asshole. <laughs> so she got on the bike and broke something. And so after my mother had taken her home, I was like, "My, see, you let them get her go and ride my bike, and now they messed up my bike. Uh-huh. See, you letting them play with my stuff. And my mother turned to me, just the way she said, she just said, one of those times that she didn't raise her voice in it. She said, because it's just the way she said it, she seemed so disappointed in it. She said, you have all of these things. You live here, and you have all of this. And you can't share anything, huh? You can't share anything. All of this stuff you have every day. And she just went back to washing the dishes. And I, somehow, because I was, it's the most fucked up my mother ever made me feel without yelling at me. Without yelling at all, she just, it's just the way she said it, like she was so disappointed in me. So I just, she just went back to washing dishes and turned away from me. And after that, I started looking at those kinds of things. I didn't want to be that, even then. I said, I don't want to be that, clinging to the stuff. You know, you know, I've been a Mario has his stuff, you know, mm-hmm. but I specifically felt challenged 
about material things and sharing. Okay. From that moment. So would you say that because she was always sharing? My mother brought kids home. I finally did. It took me years to get that. You know, my mother bring kids home all the time. All the damn time they in the pool. I gotta clean the pool. <laughs> I'm just saying. She bring all these people home. I don't know them. Playing with my shit. Getting in the pool. I gotta clean the pool. <laughs> and later on, I learned. What was it all about? I actually came to respect my mother for bringing home all the students mm -hmm. and then my father for wanting them in the pool and even for making me clean the pool. I got it years later. So, would it, um, yeah, not to sum up your experiences, but would you say that your your mom mainly, um, her, her main focal point in her parenting was uh, she challenged your morality and instilled um, uh, spirituality? Um, yeah, a lot of that. she has a rebellious side to that political, but in a different, such a human way. Yeah, where my father was more, you know, regimented, and also certainly was more telling me what to do, more directive of me. Where my mother was not so directive of me, but encouraging of stuff she would find. She would find little things that she thought was interesting about me. She wouldn't. I took apart the stereo. Okay, part of one of the things I was doing was electronic playing and stuff. I was constantly shorting out the house. Mm -hmm. The power was off. You think she ever, now that I think back, you think she ever really got mad at me? I could hear her, Robbie, what are you doing? Okay, I go, oh, oh, sorry, Mom, I'll have it on in a second. Boy, you keep shorting out the electricity. I wish you would just. Do you think she told me to stop? She was very encouraging in that. No, she just let me. I took apart the stereo, and mm -hmm. she came and got it. Mom, look, I took the stereo apart. I got a speaker on one side of the room, mm -hmm. a speaker on the other side of the room. I ran the wire all the way around the room, and look, you can play it. And then I hooked it up to this remote control thing. So if you turn on the electric, I had a long cord with the remote. You hit this, and the power comes on, it drops the record, you hear the record. And the she says, that's good, that's not my stereo. <laughs> it's not my stereo. She said, but that's okay. That's very nice, son. I'll just write her a check. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just write her a check. But that's because it's very good. It's very good. I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, Mom. I can put it back. No, no, it's very good. So yeah, she it's with the stereo. I can see the wire. <laughs> so she was that's, very encouraging. She, 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 she encouraged you. Some stuff she did like. I also designed a way to take the little rockets we used to get, you know, you little light and the little shh. Mm -hmm. And I took a big piece of brass tubing and nailed it to a piece of wood yeah. with a lighter on the end so you could aim those little skyrocket things and light it and it goes shh, mm -hmm. shoot out the end. Well, we'll set one through the clothesline. We, back then they had clotheslines mm -hmm. and burn a hole in one of my mother's towels. <laughs> so she wasn't that cool about that. Okay. <laughs> But in general, she was very she was cool about yeah because all the little vents around the house that I'm fixed that I had to fix I had knocked all of those out climbing underneath the house so all of that was broken out for me okay climbing up the house so, so when it came to um, manners in general and um, uh, sorry about that gentlemen we have three minutes remaining in this segment oh, of Mario's unscripted. Should we wrap it? We're not even. That's why I said two hours. We we never tap the surface of anything. Okay. Well, that's why I said you know you get the good part is you oh. get something to stew on, and the second good part is you get to eat. <laughs> I, I want it. I I can wait off on you. Well, you can go a little uh, over because this. Can we go a little? This one we're not we live. A little bit over. Yeah, this was not in the live ones. We're gonna want to stick please, to a schedule. This ten I, minutes. Please. Yes, you can. All right. Well, but we'll, I'm saying when yes, we go live, I promise live, we'll wrap it up. Okay, yeah, that's the part you gotta learn. Okay, I'm, I'm, then I'm, you'll I'm, start thinking about it because okay. when we go live, we gotta be on. Okay. We, just because I want to cut it and edit it. I, I, I okay. I, yeah. I, we, okay. But this was good. I see you. You're growing into it. See. Okay. You get into it. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up because uh, we, we, we haven't even touched on the dad yet. We have well, you, you, <laughs> because you, cause you put him on the couch. Okay. Yeah, and when you put him on the couch, he took your time. <laughs> this is a great lesson. Kitty. He took the your first time. Kitty touch. <laughs> right. You got me going back to the first. <laughs> See, that's what happened. Okay. The All right. Kitty touch. Okay. Let's. <laughs> this is, okay. That was wonderful. I'm sure. I'm sure. First, great. They're titties. First tongue kiss was some sure nasty stuff, though. How about y'all? You get that first we'll song, get, kiss. 
Uh, Mario, I don't want to do none of that. Mario, I do not want to know the okay. adventures of your dick. I don't uh, want to know the adventures. Now we don't get to do no dick, dick adventures. I don't that want comes to, later. I don't want your dick adventures. Okay. If that we comes do, later. if we if we do go on the journey of Mario's dicks, it's like it's it's all right, first it's all two right. or three years of your sexuality, you basically alone. Here goes two <laughs> minutes of his time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your mom. So. <laughs> when it came to so what did she when it when it came to your particulars and your environment and stuff like that and the things that she taught you when it came to um, uh, not only cleanliness but organization how was that instilled into you how how did well I was just following her example what she existed insisted upon in the house okay but notice how she also made room for me to mess up stuff okay for example. She encouraged everything I ever did. That's what's so funny. With all that discipline, I wanted chickens. I went and looked at where they were on the other side of town. You know, she wrote me to get the chickens. And then I had chickens running all around the yard. And she was telling me she knew the stories about the chickens. When I was up at camp, mm -hmm. I, I had a light-up yo. Kids liked it. I called her up and had her bring my collection of light-up I had like five of them at home up to the camp mm -hmm. so I could, to sell it. Mm -hmm. I also used to set up little, you know, lemonade stands at first. Then I started selling hot dogs and other stuff, Halloween candy. And then my mother came home one day. I was outside selling stuff. And my mother said, wow, you're selling all our groceries. <laughs> you're selling all our groceries. That's the groceries. Those are the hot dogs I got for your lunch. So, you, that's, <laughs> so but she, do you think I got in trouble for that? Not for stuff like that ever. Not for shorting out the house. Not for selling the groceries. She mostly would laugh at me. But I think well, she was seeing that I had these areas. And she was really enjoying it. So she let me. I could go, Ma, Ma, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And she would go, okay, okay. Right. <laughs> Last question. Okay. Being that you have... These habits are rather extraordinary for somebody to have, especially at that young age. How did it affect? How did you have friends if these expectations, like normal people, would have? I would think would have driven you insane with their habits of, like you said, you had to please oh, clean the pool. Friends that were just like that. A, I had a buddy down the street. His Sports this, Illustrators were in stacks by the date. But okay, and so he would you, get pissed off if you got it out of order. So you basically just made. I wasn't the only the one. It depended upon what shit you were doing. Like okay, you know you're young and an adolescent. Some of you are rebelling. That's when some of you start really showing your clothes thing. Like I was like kind of in the middle on clothes. Mm -hmm. I wanted my jeans and unique sweatshirts. But that's around the age where some of your buddies decide they want to dress better. And at first, you know, you're all kind of taken aback by that. You know, we're, we're, when we were starting to go to parties, we were walking. And all of a sudden, you had about the just social. Their, just their environment, period. Like, you go over to their house. Oh, they, they were just as uptight black parents who lived up here. Okay. But I had a buddy. He had to take all kind of music lessons and shit. His parents <laughs> had him doing lessons every day. So, like, essentially, you yeah, gotta go to lessons. I'm like, you gotta go to lessons? So every last one, so all all your friends had the same neat uh, attributions and stuff like that. So no, no, you, no, no. I wouldn't say that because but we did have some unique things of getting in trouble. Like okay. we did this thing where everybody would go by in their parents' bar and pour like this much from all the bottles into like a jar, and then we'd yeah. meet up and mix the jars and some cool. Oh dear God! <laughs> I mean, no, I know, but but. The way I would see it to me, because I look at youth, and when you think of the people today, you can see where they had this talent, right? And later on, they became this. You can see where they had at least the, the inkling of it. I was never considered one of the leader guys, and like, because it was always people would accuse me of wanting to run shit. But we mostly had a democracy. We, we were so constantly doing the dozens on each other. You know, they would crack on me. I was like, why do you always want to run shit? <laughs> so I finally stopped trying to run shit because I was so tired of my friends telling me, you always want to run shit. You always want to run shit. Why do you always got to run shit? I was like, okay, I would get mad. Like, because we would fight over the basketball. Would be my, was my basketball. Why you, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fine. Y'all play the fucking basketball. You know, it'd be that shit again. I go, like, oh, it's my shit. 
I can't say, oh, you want to run shit because you're a basketball. <laughs> you know how you are at that age? Yeah. So, no, it didn't come up with my friends. I can tell you this email. I always collected the weirdos. <laughs> I always collected the weirdos, both male and female. If you were the weird dude at school with the weird glasses, yeah. some shit, go, you, were, you were probably my friend. If you were the sister who was 10 feet tall in the 8th grade with the big old feet, <laughs> you were probably my buddy. You were probably my buddy. If you were the fat dude, you were my buddy. <laughs> or the guy who had the bad acne. <laughs> so I collected... I collected a bunch of the weirdos, but I used to always have this, I think, I used to always think, I didn't see it that way, I used to always think that I liked different things about people. Mm. So I always thought my friends were really cool, but they were definitely more the, <laughs> they were definitely more the weird, I would, that's what I would say. We would at least be, we prided ourselves in being kind of the outcasts, mm. even though I don't know that we ever really were outcasts, considering we started throwing parties, but you could even tell Vic, we kind of carried that, I kind of carried that aspect into our older years of throwing parties. When we got together, it would be like six brothers. We had like a team, and we felt like we were up against the world. It had a whole prove ourselves as men thing kind of to it and shit. I don't know, but, you know, so we did that. All right, we'll we'll pause here, and... um I, I uh, next time I still want to focus on your environment. This time I'm you call the shots. <laughs> we'll, we'll 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 speak a little bit more on your dad. I want to know what was like to uh, what was like with your brothers and how the, their effect that they had it on you. And I we're gonna focus on your friends. So your dad, your brothers, and your friends, and um, how that. How about my years as a pimp? You, you better have been a pimp. <laughs> you better have calluses. Hey, you better have the calluses <laughs> on the back of your hand. You don't tease. Like I was that. not that successful as a pimp. Do you, but I, I tried to work at it. I worked. I had to close down. <laughs> I had to close. I had trouble with the girls. Actually, you yeah, had the delusion I, down. I tried too. to talk one of my buddies in there, but he was not going for it. All right. So we'll focus on that. We'll continue this invite. We'll focus on your environment. We'll do this on the next time. So I throw it back to Vic to close us out. Thank you, gentlemen. This is the end, part one. Mario and scripted.